Hello everyone. Welcome. We are going to start. Um, so you're all here for accessibility testing, and that's great because that's the key of learning how to do things. Um, I want to introduce my co-host, this is Sami Kione, and together we are in the accessibility team, but not alone. Hello everybody. Um, Andrea Furcia will help us out. He is the main programmer of the accessibility team, and he works for Yoast. And this is an announcement, Sami will work for 10UP. So, <laughs> and then we have hidden in the corner Adrian Rosselli. He's really small, <laughs> now tall. <laughs> he is not WordPress based, but he is one of the leading accessibility people of the world, and he flew in especially for Red Cup US to Serbia. So, thank you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> so, for this workshop, we made a website with all the exercises, all the things you need to know, know all the links to uh, important content. And that's training.wp slash accessible.org. And if you have a laptop, could you please install that or uh, go to that URL? And then I tweeted it, and I hope you got the email. Uh, we have a list of add-ons and plugins you can install. It's in a spreadsheet, but there are also links in the in the website with all the topics. I don't know who has done that before. Who has done the, the install of the plugins? Oh, excellent, good. So that saves time. If there's anything you need to ask or something that yeah you don't understand, please uh, ask away. Don't wait. Just ask. Raise your hand, and I will try. Or we all will try to answer your questions. So it will be interactive. And Monique isn't allowed to raise her hand. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Now, in the. Okay, tell me. I use always three browsers, Safari, Chrome, and Firefox. And I, d I have a Mac, so I don't have Edge or um, um, what's the other devious browser. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> but you can use any browser you like. But it's, it's, it's nice, but some, some things work better in, in some browsers, some test tools and other in other browsers. So I use always three browsers. Then, um, for this workshop, we have a short intro about accessibility. I will tell something about the guidelines because we are going to test, so against what? Um, something about briefly about project workflow. When are you going to test? Then, one hour about design, one hour about web content, and then we have a short break. And after that, Sami will take over and he will do the development stuff, this real code-based uh, testing. So if you are not really a sp developer, you are allowed to leave that. Um, so, we have a format for all, the, um, for all the issues. What are we going to test? Why? Does it need to, do th to work that way? How are we going to test and how to fix it? Just give you examples on how to fix it. And we need to, you to try yourself. Well, thankfully, we have good Wi-Fi. So we have to try yourself. You get a, a test tool and you, uh, an, a, a website, an example, and we try to find the errors ourselves. So that's the key. Do everything here yourself. And if you don't understand something, ask one of four of us and we try to help you. So. Something about the guidelines. What is web accessibility? Well, there, is, um, there are many definitions. One I like is from Sarah Kohlberg. Web accessibility is the degree in which a website is usable by as many people as possible. So not just that one blind guy that never visits your website, but everybody. And how do you measure that? For that, we have WCAG. And that's an abbreviation of Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. And these are made by the W3C. So these are the guidelines we, um, uh, made by the experts who also write the specs of the HTML 
5 and the CSS. And there are a few versions. At the moment, we are at version 2.0, but it will soon be 2.1. For WordPress, we still have 2.0 and will be soon, in a few weeks, switch to 2.1. 2.1 is just uh, an extension. There are a few more rules added. But I want to write a blog post and explain to you all um, what's changed. And I didn't write that yet. So we stick to 2.0 at the moment. But that's, that's very good too. Um, then you have the... the okay, cool. okay. These are based on four principles. I will do this very short. Okay. Perceivable. All content must be available for everyone. Operable. Every visible must use must be able to use all functionality. <coughs> Understandable, can a visitor understand the content and how the website works? And robust, does my site work on every device? And here accessibility links also to all the new devices that are made lately, your iPhone, maybe some interface in your car. So accessibility also means it works on every device. So we have three levels. A, that's basic. Double A, and that's good. And that's the global standard. I think almost every country in the world sticks to WCAG 2 AA. So if you want to know what guidelines we use WordPress for WordPress and for uh, worldwide, it's WCAG 2 AA. Then you have triple A, and that's for really dedicated software. So that's really hard to meet for a website. So we don't stick to triple A, we do double A. So, and as the we um, um, implement, implemented this as a statement in WordPress, all new and updated code released in WordPress, that's WordPress core, must conform with WCAG 2 AA. And that will be soon WCAG 2.1. After that, who benefits from all this? 20% of all your users. So if, for example, um, you don't have the blind guy, but you also have someone who is deaf, someone who cannot move their arms very well, someone who can't hear very well or see very well, is colorblind, someone who uses an iPhone in the sun. All those different cases are covered with WCAG 2 AA. And one big example, if you have to sell it to your client, Google is blind and deaf. So if you want good SEO, use accessibility, uh, an accessible code, and then Google can also index your code better, your website better. There's a few, uh, I will go, don't go through them, but there's a few resources you can uh, read with stuff further. Are there questions about this? Yeah. What's the difference between, uh, I'm sorry. Hello? Okay. <laughs> uh, hi, I'm Dan. Quick, could, is there a summary about like what's the difference between 2.0 and 2.1? I will uh, publish a blog post uh, in a few days, and there are also many posts on on the internet. If you difference 2.1, 2.0, if you Google that, you get a many blog posts about it. But I want to do a blog post especially for WordPress. But that will be uh, when I uh, re um, recover, recovered from. <laughs> so, okay. I'm just going to point out one resource is what was in the last page. We have been writing the accessibility handbook, which is really a handy way to actually start learning more about accessibility. We have kind of topics from the design, content, and markup, and testing as we try to do today. So that's kind of one resource that you can always come back and learn more. And there are more resources after those summer articles in there. So. It's like you can take like when there's like 30 days of JavaScript learning, you can take like 30 days of accessibility learning sessions also in yeah. a sense of learning like 30 minutes in a day or something. Yeah, that's uh, the first link here, WordPress Accessibility Handbook. There's a ton of information. Okay, workflow. When do you start testing? And when you are going to include accessibility, that's at the very first stage, when you talk to your client, when you talk to your project manager, when you talk to your boss. 
What plugins do you need? Are they accessible? What functionality do you need? Can everybody use that? You have to think that before you start designing before your quotation. Because if someone wants a really complicated plugin and the plugin isn't accessible, maybe you have to build it in house and then it's far more costly. So before you make your quotation, look at what will be the functionality and how are we going to build that. Then, is there audio and video? Does the client have budget to, for example, do transcriptions or captions? Some clients don't have the budget for that, and maybe they cannot include a video. Because if you have an accessible website, everybody should be able to get the content. So if someone is deaf and there's no and there's video with speech, well, uh, she can't hear it. So audio and video, is there budget to have captions? And then PDFs and other digital documents. PDFs are notoriously hard to get accessible. That's very difficult to do. So if you have a website, for example, contact migration, with a lot of PDFs in it, you may consider that's not the best way to do it, to add those PDFs to the website. Maybe you have to uh, come with someone else, something else. And that may be very costly too. So before your quotation, consider that. And then the branding colors. There is a famous example from the Dutch University, the Erasmus University, and they had a lovely green. That was their branding color. And then they wanted that color in the website for the text and for the buttons, but it was too light. People couldn't read that well. And then they had to talk for like six months with all the directors to change that green color to actually implement it in the website. So do that before you start designing, because if you have the design ready and the color isn't ready, then, yeah, then, you, um, then it's very hard to change that. But if you do it in front and you change also the branding colors from um, the company itself, then it's much easier to implement it in the website because it's right from the start. Then you get on design and we're going to um, talk about that front-end code and web content. So I'm first going to address design, then content, then a short break, and then Sami will talk about the code. Are there questions about this? Good. Design. These are the topics I want to address. Color contrast. Not by color alone. The order of things animation, and the use of icons. And we are going to test for this. So here, here starts your working. Color contrast. Now there is a rule, and it is a really complicated rule. But calm down, there are so many test tools for this. The visual presentation of text and images of text has a contrast ratio of at least 4.5 to 1. Large-scale text or larger text of at least 24 pixels, normal or 19 pixels bold, and images of a large-scale text have a contrast ratio of at least 3.1. So this is really complicated, but we have test tools. And there are many, many test tools. In the handbook, we have a list of all the test tools, and I want to demonstrate a few for you. And I'm going to sit now. <laughs> Do you have all the, all the website in front of you? Who hasn't the website in front of him? Her. Okay, good. So why is contrast important? Now, people are colorblind, people are older and don't see contrast very well, screens in the sun. And also be kind, do it not for text alone, but also for borders and input fields and placeholders. So, one of the most basic ones, and I really actually like this one a lot. If you are a designer, you have a color and a background color. This only goes for text, text and a background color. They should have sufficient background. So if you have, for example, a text with this color, you put in the hexadecimal uh, code of the text, and for background, 
And you see, this is a very bad contrast. You can't even read it uh, pr probably from there. So, don't tip over. So, this is very convenient. WCAG 2, AA compliant? No. So, it doesn't get much easier than that. If you are a designer, you know the hexadecimal color, you add the front end color and the background color, and it gives you a no, or maybe a yes. Um, let's find something out. Is one F too much? So. so, this is much better to read. Yeah, we can comply it. Yes. The contest ratio is 5.9. So, this way below 4. Point. So, here can you calculate. And there are tools for sketch. Is Maya here? Okay, no. Maya, if we went to the Maya, uh, the, the talk by Maya, there are tools for sketch who actually can calculate the contrast ratio for you. And Maya has another one, this color contrast. Just put com, I think. No, maybe it's here. And the Wi-Fi is slow. Come on, wake up. Okay. There is another one, a simple one by WebAIM. And it does the same, actually. Foreground color, background color, contrast ratio. And it says it passes for WCAG 2AA. And it, and it's here also it checks for triple A. And it shows you how, to, how it looks. Um, this is the color contrast analyzer for Sketch. I don't have Sketch, but there's a link on it in the website, so you can try and you can uh, see if it works. But that you can do in your own time. Then there are tools you can check for a color in a browser. If you already have a website and you think, okay, how do my colors do? There is one is a browser add-on for X. Uh, for uh, Chrome and for Firefox. That's called X, and I installed that so we can see it. Um, now we do the website WordPress 18. Oh, I'm working in Safari, it's not a Safari. Up, 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 up. Um, let's try the WordPress of uh, Europe. So what X does, if you install that as an add-on, and you do inspect, it's a bit low. Does anyone know how to access this, the inspector? Does anyone we don't know, sorry. <laughs> okay. You look uh, control, and then opens a window, and you, say you see an inspect. Oh, do that, not an image, preferably. Inspect, and it's the same for Chrome and for Safari and for Firefox. Then you get actually your HTML. That's if you're not a design, if you're not a coder, you don't. You say what the hell? There's a one tab you can add. It's at its X. You can analyze, and you get all the accessibility errors. So, elements must have sufficient color contrast. Can you see this? Elements, 18 violations. And it gives you exactly the code where it goes wrong. The Sava Center. You say, okay, inspect node, Sava Center. I don't know where it is exactly. You can also say highlight. Oh, it's the wrong one. Okay. Can, can you, um, okay. Color contrast. If you call control and then click, inspect, and it, you have X, you say analyze, and this one has two violations. And you see highlight, and it highlights. 
and this is the zero and this is the zero from the this is this zero this has two little contrast and this is the toolbar from WordPress so it's a good tip if you test your website log out because WordPress gives a lot of errors sorry about that <laughs> So back to the WordPress, uh, okay. And then you have Wave. And Wave is much easier if you're not a developer. That's also an, uh, a browser add-on. And it adds a button. And you can click it, Wave. And what it does, you get here a summary of errors, alerts, features. Features is good. And you can see it also refers to what's in the website. So we look at, for example, uh, the alerts. And this is like he's making a guess. Maybe this is good, maybe it's not good. But maybe it's more clear if we go to a website with a lot of errors. wave it gives one error it's an empty heading that's maybe a content manager who <coughs> actually uh, pressed on return or an empty heading it has uh, all kind of features you can browse through and, and uh, see what they are and they have uh, okay, yeah so I'll let him shut up Shut up, I said. Come on. Yeah. Oh, no. I'll refresh it. <laughs> okay. And then there is Color Alley for Chrome. And that's also an add on. And it also adds a tab in your inspector Color Alley. And here you can have a drop down of uh, how to, uh, drop how how do who do you call this um, color picker yeah I drop okay you go to one and you determine a background for example black and it gives you if it passes for normal text and if it passes for large text so there are many tools online and you have to pick the one that works the best for you so, do it yourself. WordCamp Central. Pick the tool you like or that you installed. And just check how the color contrast of this website is. Does every, everybody has a tool like he wants to check? Yeah. Sorry, sorry, what? Color Alley. Color, color, yeah. A one one Y. Sorry, yeah. I'm asking which add-on it was that you've, the last one that you've used after Wave. Color only, okay. It's if the link is in the in, in the list. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> so we can wander around in here if yeah. you need yeah. help at you this see. point, for example, actually installing the plugins, or if you don't know how they actually work, oh, okay. yeah, like and then we can start testing. Yeah. So yeah. 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 Can you put this off for a while so I can...
sex in there. Yeah. And for ex um, Yeah. Okay. Oh. I see people using X of uh, using wave a lot. A wave also gives errors that are not really errors, just uh, like warnings. So you have to specifically look at the errors. Yeah. Are you getting along? Wave goes okay. away. How So what you maybe discover, there are errors, you think, oh, that's not an error at all, or it's missing errors, why? <laughs> this is not a perfect tool. There is no perfect accessibility test tool that you press one button and you get all the answers and all the errors. You have to evaluate from what it is say, does it actually make sense? Because you can get false positives and think that missed are missed. So it's not really hard science. So, does everyone have a, a chord of a feeling how to set this up? And I want to go to the next topic, and that's not by color alone. So, what do we mean with that? Um, a website has to be visible by someone who is colorblind. And if you saw Maya's talk, she had some good examples. One good example before, uh, example, if you have an error message and you have only a red line in your input fields, then people who are colorblind cannot see the error message. So there's a really nice tool for that to check how someone sees your website who is colorblind, and that's called SimDaltonism. And that's an app for the Mac. And then I need a colored website, of course. Example, WordCamp Nijmegen. I'll disable oh, this one. Yeah. 
So you see in work in Nijmegen, the links are not underlined. Or here you have, for example, the text mailt je aan, that's red. And if you cannot see any text of any color, maybe you can miss the link then, and you can have a simulation with that. Uh, where was it? Here. So where the error is, the arrow is your, your mouse pointer is, then you see how someone with, who only see um, the grayscale can see the links or can see the colors. And then you can see this link is completely invisible. You can see it if you're not colorblind, but if you are colorblind, you cannot see the links. And this is a call to action link. So this is a very good tool to check, and it has different kinds of um, oh, different kinds of sorts of disabilities of, of uh, color blindness. Most common is that people cannot see the difference between red and green and black. So maybe they see your website completely different. So this is a nice tool to check your website with. How does someone with color blindness see your website? Simdultanism. Yeah? Sorry? Simdultanism. It's, um, it's in the list, it's here. And you have also Koblis, uh, uh, and that's a website you can upload an, lo load an image to. And then you can see how the image reacts for someone who's color blind. <coughs> and then for sketch, you have a colorblind simulator, and I don't have Sketch, so I can't demonstrate it to you, but you can uh, download it for free, and then in your Sketch, you can simulate different kinds of colorblindness. But Simdultonism is really nice for the Mac. It's, it's an app. It's not an add-on for the browser, it's really an app. So, let's check the website of thesun.co.uk. If you see, there is a menu, and you can only see if some menu is active by a change in color. <coughs> so, so, how does someone with color blindness see this, for example? Maybe he cannot see what the active menu is. So, make another way to make a menu active, like make it bold, or another way. This is also a good tool to show your client or your graphic designer who is stubborn to see, but it's beautiful and I like it, and they say, okay, but 8% um, of all men is colorblind, so a, a large percent of, of your, webs, uh, your visitors may not understand what the case is here. And this one I found, that was really beautiful example of how not to do things, and that's, a Dutch website, and I can show this because we are going to rebuild this accessible. So this is just, <coughs> if you order there something, you get a, hopefully, okay, you get a form here. It's a very gray form. If I forget to fill out stuff, then it only adds a red border. So this is very inaccessible, so don't do this. And if your graphic designer says, yeah, but this is the way to do it, show it maybe for someone who looks at it in grayscale. And they maybe see a lightly uh, thicker border, but if it has no meaning, if there's no error warning with it, maybe it's just uh, he forgets what the meaning is or doesn't get what the meaning is that is wrong. So that's what I mean with not by color alone. Check your design in grayscale. Can I still figure out what the meaning is? Can I still figure out what's wrong, what active menu I am, or maybe you have a beautiful uh, image <coughs> with meaning? So, are there questions about this? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Wait a second. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Hi. So uh, input fields and labels. Yeah. 
Um, are labels something that is mandatory or not? Because I think those are shown as uh, errors. Labels as errors. Labels, yeah, because if the input field doesn't have a label associated with it. Oh, well, that's HTML. Yeah, that's that's really code based. You have yeah. to have if your input field, you have to have a label attached. Um, uh, label four is, and then uh, you give the input field an, an ID, an ID, f some ID, a unique ID, and a four is connected to the real ID. So the label is connected to the input field. But uh, I think Sami will uh, address that. That's that's really code based. But what what is good if you have um, whether that's maybe um, if you have an input field. Um, And yes, always there should be a label in a form. Visible, yeah. Yeah, preferably also visible, yes. <laughs> yep. well, uh, this is also an, a good example for this. Shut up. Here you have the label. That's actually the placeholder. So uh, the disadvantage of this is if you start typing, the placeholder disappears and people forget what to fill out. This is just you start typing and then you remove it again. What should I fill? Oh, this my this I had need to fill out. Just a visual label is better for everyone. So just as th that makes it an, uh, a form much more clear. That's that's good practice, and I think maybe we're can I ask two point one reply. <laughs> yeah. Uh, is it correct to should you should the input be attached to sorry should the label be attached to the input? or the input wrapped inside the label? Because I do see a lot of plugins actually implement. The both are kind, kind of fine, but the best way of doing it is that there is separate. the for and ID, because that works pretty much in every software. Yeah. And it's don't like wrap the input example, with the yeah. label. Yeah, if yeah. you if yeah. You wrap it inside, uh, 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 then some uh, voice recognition software don't announce it well. Yeah. And if you do it separately, then it works guaranteed every, every time. So it's far more robust. The, the input is more clickable. Shall we, shall we um, address the code base uh, yeah, later yeah, on? Yeah, sure. <laughs> and now she won't finish yeah, the color, yeah. because this is a, d a discussion we can have uh, long. Oh, yeah. Okay. You have another question? No, I'm not allowed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're so into revenge, are you? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Monique is my friend, for people who think I'm play insulting play her. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is another example for um, not by code alone, not by color alone. This is uh, a selector for uh, a date for this. Is you can make an appointment with the, um, the government. And all the dates are still available are green. Dates are not available are blue. So if you cannot distinguish color, you have not a clue which days are available. You have to make a guess. So what they did, <laughs> they improved it. So all the days are available are now dark gray and not available are light gray. But the color contrast is awful. So this is still not right. If you are a good designer, find something better. Maybe with color, but also made an I with an icon like uh, uh, um, what think you? What is that? Um, think you? A check or an X through the date. That's far more uh, informative than just a slight color difference. This is a, a website that needs to be accessible because this is uh, that you need to make an appointment with the government. So this is really bad. Dutch government's really great. Is this clear? Don't give meaning and color. Always add extra information. Any questions? Then I won't. In the back, yeah? Do you have examples that show, like, best practices or websites that Im do implement accessibility? Everything what's on the bbc.co.uk is in okay. okay. BBC is excellent. If you go to good practice, go to the BBC. It's really nice. Okay. Yeah.
And maybe you have one? I, I reference the BBC and Patterns. Yeah. They do such a good job. BBC Patterns, yeah. They have, yeah, okay. So, then the order of things. Not everyone has an overview over, your whole, over the whole screen. Some people only see a tiny bit. And they have a struggle to find stuff on the site. For example, maybe someone sees only this tiny bit of the screen. And if your submit button is like here, that's really hard. They have to scan the whole page. That's what they do actually. They just scan the whole page until they find what they need. So you have to put the action and the submit button close together. You have actually things that belong together, you have to put together, and that's a, a design a principles, gestalt design. Proximity of controls, put things together so you don't force people to actually scan the whole page. And this is not only for people who only see a small port part, it's for most people. They expect things to belong together and put them in the right order. So this is from the Dutch railway when you want to connect to the Wi-Fi. You uh, are on the train, you open your laptop, you want to connect to the Wi-Fi. Then it's here, big button, make connection with the internet. And below there is you have to agree with the terms. So what you do, you read from top to bottom and you see, okay, I see the button connect, um, uh, connect with the internet and you press that and nothing happens. They did it okay for the mobile version. Then you have free internet on the train, I agree with the terms, make connection. This is what people expect. So if you design, read from top to bottom, and you say, is it logical order? Are the things presented to the user in the logical order and also close together? This is not a tool you can test with, this is just common sense. Just read with other eyes, not your own eyes. Don't expect people to have an overview over everything that's on the page. So, do it yourself. Check the order of your own site. Maybe in mobile, uh, mobile version or, or whatever, if you have a website or try a website out, look, is everything in the order you want? Look at just the design. I don't have really an example for this. Does everyone, uh, someone has a, a website to share maybe? Don't be shy, we won't shoot you. I, I don't want, but I don't want to call her out, so. <laughs> <laughs> it's not me, is it? <laughs> no, it's not you. <laughs> not this time. Okay. Yeah. Developer K with K. D E developer K dot org. Develop. Oh, wait, develop. This. Uh, and A at the end. Developer. K A. Yeah. A A. That's female developer, in Serbian. Okay. So if someone wants, you expect content at the top, and that's there. I think you may in, could improve with the font size here. <laughs> okay. And then there's the heading. This is first the menu and then the heading, and this is kind of your, okay. You're really a designer, are you? <laughs> okay. I think I don't think anything wrong. Actually, this is the, the the title, and then you get the metadata, and then you get the text. And what's this? This is sidebar. Oh, this is a table of content. Oh, for all the okay. And then you jump to inside the page to yeah. okay. Well, I think this is a logical order of things. Yeah. Maybe something, I will leave it here. Maybe we'll have another thing. <laughs> okay. Are there questions about this? 
I think just think, put yourself in in place of someone who cannot see the whole page. Yeah. Keeping the um, the, oh, I forgot what you called it at the top of the page. Uh, oh, fuck. The actions with next to the um. Keep what keep together what belongs together. Yeah. yeah. Um, are there plans to implement that, like within the media library of WordPress? Is if you can make a design, what actually makes sense, please submit it. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. Yeah. Okay. Because WordPress is who makes it, eh? who shows up, and who contributes. If, if you think, okay, I, I'm not a designer, I don't know a solution for that. But if you're a designer, you think, okay, maybe you can propose uh, designs. Then animation, there you go. If you have animation on your website, it distracts enormously. And most people cannot even read the text below anymore or on the side. How long can you stand this? <laughs> animation must be stoppable by the user. So if you see a website with animation, you think, okay, how can I stop this? So make a stop button or something that is really stopped. So there's no test tool for this, just check the website. Is there animation? Can I stop it? Or does it run, for example, like three seconds and then stops? That's okay too. But this is really, many people cannot read your content anymore and well, what you write in your website is actually for the content, I think. So, if you have a slider, uh, uh, it's a slider like uh, on the front page and a check, check. Sometimes it goes fast and then you decide for the user how fast she should read. Not everybody reads that fast. Some people, English isn't, for example, the native language of your site is in English, so they need more time to read. And then it's the next slide already. So give them control. Don't make them slide automatically, but give the people control over now I want to read the next slide and now the next slide. So, make animation possible and give the user control about the speed. Now I can, oh, I have ad blocker, I have to do this without ad blocker. La, la, la. This is such a fun side. And now I hope they have a really loud. Or do I have a blah? I have block. Maybe, oh, okay, it depends. Sometimes they have a purr here on the background, a huge, they don't have at the moment. Okay, that's a pity they had yesterday. <laughs> no. Okay, I'll try to find another example. This is a, a famous one. I really love this site. What I do when I want to read this, I put my hand over the screen and I just try to read this because it's so distracting. I think, why? This is really bad website. Now this is one, this is from France and they have a slider. But they have controls. You can control your own speed, you can start and you can stop the animation, and it shows you where you are. This is really very user-friendly. You have complete control of what you want to see, if you want to stop it, if you want to go to the next slide, if you want to just more time, just you stop the animation, go to the next slide yourself. This is how it's done. The link is in the in the website. It's a really good example of an uh, accessible slider. So if you look at your site and you see animation, can it be stopped? Can the user get control? There are some uh, in CSS tricks, there are, are um, discussions about this, and this is a start-stop slider as an example. So if you have a client who desperately needs a slider on the home page for what reason, whatsoever, go to this solution. 
In general, I would not recommend sliders, but that's uh, another um, issue. And then the last, use of icons. Ah, animation's gone. Don't make me guess. Were there questions about um, the slide, the animation? Yeah. Um, what do you think about um, like um, subtle animations of different U UI elements in design? For example, kind of like a jumping arrow, down arrow that shows that you have to scroll down or something. It, in your opinion, is that too intrusive? And is it intrusive? a con continuous jumping? I don't like know, maybe uh, if you, you have sometimes when you uh, want to force the users to go down the fold, you, know, you have like an arrow, so doing, 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 yeah. doing. I think that's bloody annoying. Yeah, but do you think that, yeah. do you think that there's like, um, it hinders some people or, or it's just annoying? Um, is there a real... Attention disorder? Well, yeah? The, the general gist is in animation, it's fine if it's subtle and reinforces. Hey, I got a microphone, so I'm going to say some of this again. In animation, is fine if it is if it is subtle and it reinforces the action. If it is continuous and the user cannot stop it, that is a problem. Um, distinguishing between subtle and not is a bit of your own decision, but you put it in front of users, you'll know pretty quickly. But don't loop it. Make it subtle, make sure it reinforces an action and is not gratuitous. But it's, it's for people with an attention disorder? The, for the people who benefit from this? It, a lot of people will benefit from it more. Th in my own uh, testing with users, more people tend to benefit from a very simple direct animation than will be harmed by it. But as soon as you start going crazy with it, and you know, it makes noise and their computer catches fire, probably don't do that. <laughs> OK, yeah. Oh, hey, there's a microphone. Oh, there's an extra. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Should a slider play automatically the moment you start on the moment the page loads, or should the should the user actually decide if they want it to play or not? I, I think it's okay if it uh, starts automatically, only if it's stoppable. If if, if someone sees okay, it slides automatically, and there must be a way to stop it. Okay. Then, don't make me guess. I think it is uh, a really hot topic at the moment with uh, a new editor coming out with all kinds of icons. Um, add text or a tooltip to an icon. Design for your users. For example, these three lines. We are all tech savvy. We know it's a hamburger menu, or maybe it's justify. I don't know, it's the same icon. It's two different meanings. If you are not tech savvy, if you're not that smart with the computer, you have to guess what this means. On your next birthday party, ask your family how long it took for them, or if they ever discovered that that is a menu. That's really a big problem, and if your menu is the access to the rest of your website, some people will actually not be able to see the rest of your content. So always add a word to your icon. You can use a wonderful icon, no matter what, but add a word, what it means next to it, or a tooltip. That's really important, because you design for your users. So look at your icons. Are they understandable? Is there text with it? Does every user get that? But not everybody's as smart as you are. So, Gutenberg demo. Launch is in August, I heard. Yes, okay. So, this is what? The wheel. Shout. And this is what? More. Come up. And this is what? Yeah, you shut up. Okay. <laughs> and what, what information is it about? <laughs> um,
this this is what adding adding something and um, this oh did maybe I'll scroll up a bit is it possible no can you see this is it on or off yeah you sure and now now it's on now it's off okay why do you think that But because there's a one, then it's on. Andrea, you're wonderful. <laughs> that wasn't the case before. Yeah. So if we go to, for example, plus. Now you see you have icons and there's text below it. That will save people so much time to actually understand what it is. So you add a block here. And I, you get information about the content, about uh, how, how many headings, how many paragraphs, how many blocks, how many words. Okay. This is a learning curve. You have to learn to work with the editor to know what all the icons mean. For if you, for example, hover over something, there's a lot of icons. Paragraph, this is the way the text is aligned, bold. So these are all icons. And now I don't know if it's the new version. No. Actually, if you hover over the new version, yeah, you get link. You see? So this is the way to do it. You actually add some way of extra context to your icons. So the people that no, don't understand what the icons mean can actually have a way to understand, okay, this is adding a link. Not everybody is as clever as you are or uses the web of, or the interface as much as you are. So help them add text to your icons so that you can check yourself. There's no tool for that, it's just your eyes. Well, what the last of, of the icons you mean, or? You go down to the if you go down to where you were showing those, click on a block, and then go up and get the tooltip, yeah, like that. R like there's something right below italic, which is the it's the it's the command yeah, I. Yeah, that's whatever. a short code. But but it's, it's a, yeah. the color con. It's a great illustration of how, bad know, color contrast. Bad color contrast. There's there's an issue for that. <laughs> yeah, but I'm just saying it's a great yeah, example. No yeah, issue, yeah. You, if you, I mean, it's cool from, that from it's there, there. From there, you cannot read it. You mean yourself, but right. maybe from your screen also not. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, it's it's great that it's there. I like that, but it, it, the color contrast makes yeah. it very hard to see. Well, you learned already something here on the. <laughs> Excellent. Other questions about icons. Okay, this is the part about uh, design. Are there other design? Questions before I go into content. Yeah. Um, it actually concerns icons, and I think like the tooltip. Um, how do you deal with tooltips like on hover? That's not really happening on mobile, where you don't use a mouse or where you can't use a mouse. I'm really interested what the solution would be for that. Oh, Mike, Mike, Mike. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, right now, for mobile, there's no solution yet. We are discussing that. Uh, Tooltips works also on Focus, so are good for keyboard users also on the desktop. On the desktop. But for mobile, we haven't addressed the, the, the issue yet. So if you're a designer uh, and you have a solution... Keep in mind that tooltips are a trade-off themselves because... The, the ideal, the best, the best option would be a visible text label close to the icon. So. Yeah. If, I, if I may, remember tooltips are sometimes factored into the accessible name calculation, and tooltips come from the title attribute. So I recommend against using the title attribute because some browser screen reader combinations can blow up what the real text is and use the title instead. If you want to do tooltips, there are accessible ways to do it, but you still need to understand that it's only ever supplemental information and on mobile users typically cannot get to it. And uh, there are some techniques that we can talk about separately way outside of this. They're a little bit more technical, but just 
avoid tooltips is the general gist. So there goes Gutenberg. Okay. <laughs> Okay, next, content. Did you ever listen to your website? Um, I will get that to that later. I want to address um, uh, four topics. That's readability. How readability is your site and how can I assess for that? Heading structure, the, the H1, the H2, the H3. Meaningful link text and alternative text for images. So there are four topics, and I want to start with readability. This might surprise you. Reading level of your text, write for someone who is 12 years or maximum old. And you think, well, my, my audience is way smarter than that. But then you presume that your audience read in the optimal optimal um, condition. Maybe they're hungover, maybe they're tired, maybe um, they have a cat on their nap uh, who is nagging, uh, maybe uh, they have a child who is uh, talking to them. So nobody ever said, my text is too easy to read. So keep it a level of 12 years old. Start with a short summary of the content. People browse through the internet, Nev nobody reads. They browse and they, skip and they see, okay, this is what they want to read and read from there. So if you start a page, just a blog post or really a page with content, with a short summary of the content, then people know, okay, this is what I'm interested in, in or this, this I want to skip. So it saves time. And divide the rest in blocks, headings, lists, make it appealing to read, images. Use large enough font, good enough line height, and limit the content width. So, there is a lot about this in the handbook, the readability in the accessibility handbook. And there are tools for that, to check your text. And we are in WordPress are fortunate to have the Yoast SEO um, plugin. And nice of that is that it also does a readability check that's actually quite good. So, if you go to this, it adds this, uh, the Yoast SEO plugin. I think everybody knows that. It adds a readability check. And it gives you, this is good and this is wrong. So I need to do something about my text. But it is here, it gives you the flash reading ease test. And it gives you a number. And if this is a green bullet, your text is good to read for 12 years max. So this is an easy text. How difficult is my text? Just Yoast SEO, readability, and see if the readability is good enough. That's really easy. Yeah. There are a few languages. I don't know, English, Dutch, or maybe German? Do you know that? Yeah? Russian? Can I click on what? Change language. Change language. Oh, but then you have to change the language of your site. It doesn't say, uh, no, it, 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 um, it reads the language you have. Um, what? No, but, but if you want to use it as a test for, your, for your, uh, your own website and your website isn't English, then well, it's convenient if you have the same text, uh, I think. Um, so I, th I think there are a few major languages they have to, to check for, and I don't know if it's in Serbian. Maybe they will. Okay. There's no Serbian yet. <laughs> no. Okay. Oh, there's the real <laughs> Yoast. <laughs> okay, expert. Um, English, German, Dutch, French, Spanish, and Italian. So maybe there will be more. Okay. Any questions about this? There are online many, many tools, but mostly are English-based. Yeah, so this is the only one I know that checks for Dutch, for example, or German, or the other languages. So. Is there a way to change the, uh, the, uh, the box from which the plugin... Uh, Thank you. 
you know, change the plugin to not take the text from uh, the content box, but instead I, I don't know a custom. That. Okay. Yeah. I don't know that. That you have to go to the boot and okay. ask questions. <laughs> And uh, this is not sponsored by Yoast. I just think it's a good tool. <laughs> but you can <laughs> but buy I by don't, the Yoast I don't booth. Sorry? Uh, you you can come by by the Yoast booth later yeah. on and then I know that for sure. I, also <laughs> I think there is a plugin who also adds meta tags, metadata, or who you call um, meta uh, fields? Meta fields? For that? For Yoast? But, oh, you, you add. You, you ask Yoast. He knows people from Yoast. So uh, what you can do, if you have Yoast SEO um, installed, you can, uh, for example, do a new post. And this is maybe you can all practice. If you have a, a site online, do you have? And then, for example, this is the website. Oh. I copy paste some text and I look at the readability of your site. <laughs> <laughs> and then you can check what needs to be improved on. This is just a portion of your text I took, so it doesn't have headings, but you can copy paste just in an empty post and then check how good the text is. Any more questions about readability? Yeah. Okay, you talked about tools. Uh, do you know about the Hemingway app, for example? But that's only English language based. Yes. But that's a good tool. Yeah. Because yeah, I was using it. Yeah. Okay. I've got a link uh, in, in the, the page about readability. I've got a link to more um, uh, different tools. But they are all English-based, so I wanted to show this because it's WordCamp Europe. But uh, there's a li list in the, the, to, the different tools. So you can check out if you're checking your English, then you can check out if, uh, it's, if there's one that you like. Okay, then I want to talk about heading structure. And I want to let you listen to your website. Um, the people who are blind get the website read out loud. And that's really tedious to go from top to bottom every time. So they have short ways to navigate. And one way to navigate is with headings. And I'm going to start up the native screen reader and if there is sound that will be nice do I have sound? hello? Menu. Use volume 100% Oh, menu. there she goes. Chrome. Heading structure. Test web accessibility. Window. Heading structure. Oh. Muting. Muting. Okay. This screen reader is for Apple users. It's native to you. And it works best, uh, actually only best in Safari. And you start it up with Command F5. Don't do that all at the same time. Because it's a lot of noise. Okay. Heading structure, test web accessibility, web content. Okay, I'll start reading. Heading structure, test web accessibility, web content. Link, skip to content. Visited, link, test web accessibility. Workshop, visited, link, home, expand child menu, collapsed button, visited, muting. So this is really awkward. You want to read the page, but you have to go through the menu all again. Or you have to use the skip link Sami is going to tell about. Um, but what you can do, you can call on a list of headings. It's called the web router. It's uh, Control Alt U, and then you start headings. You get the headings, and this is a super easy way to fast navigate the website. H1. This is what the page is about. Only use one H1. 
If you want to know about best practices, you press enter, and then it starts reading from best practices. This is such a time saver, but then the headings must make sense. If you have headings all over the place just to make text big, and no real content that's related about it below, then it's a useless heading. If you want to have big text, do it with CSS. Just don't give it a random heading like, okay, this is a good size, okay, this will be the heading. Headings must be meaningful and in the right order. For example, if I put the web router again, one H1, then there's an H2, best practices, and then there's H3, and the that actually resides below the best practices. And then H2, uh, H3 and H3, they all reside below the best practices. And then there's an H2 again. So this makes actually sense. I can read the content of this page by the heading structure. This is essential also for your SEO, because this way also Google knows what the content of your website is, what it presents. Super, super important. So, there's one good thing in Gutenberg, as we saw, with the information icon, you can call the headings of your content. You see? Title, H2, 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 H2. So that's good in Gutenberg. There are a few tools you can use to test what the headings are. For example, in Chrome you have headings map and then you can see the headings of a page do they do they actually represent the content and is the order right don't skip a heading level don't mix them up make a really order of the heading level so who has this uh, installed on chrome on firefox okay shall we um, check some websites Don't be shy. Thanks, I have for you, for example, wwwwordpress.org. Let's check your heading structure that you can do yourself. If you don't have this, you can also do it with WAVE. This is visible. We have a break in, 20 in, in uh, 30 minutes, or if you want to have a drink now, maybe. Everybody has something to drink, we have a break soon. Okay, what do you think of this heading structure? What's the first error? You have two eight ones. You have one H, we should have one eight one and telling this is what the page is about. So actually, the first H1 is on the logo, and the other is big text. Then the second one, these are actually H2. These make sense. Trust the best, powerful features, community. These are content about these. And then suddenly there's an H4. WordPress swag. News from my blog. This is a kind of a mess. Yeah. Um, who has the microphone? Uh, so, uh, a question about one H1 per page. There was something about HTML5 where if your heading hierarchy is like per section, so you have yeah. like multiple sections and each section. He's the guy to answer that because I think he blew that. Can that have idea. like each own uh, each H1. Like, uh, what's yeah. the situation with it in practice? When uh, the HTML5 specs came out first, that was something recommended, you pointed, and you, you pointed were, at me, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> the the document outline algorithm was never implemented by any browser. So what you're talking about, where you could have an H1 per sectioning element, would reset the headings. No. So no that's not actually a thinking like real world. 
uh, you could do it, but it would still be broken. But I should not. Right. Uh, I should not because I asked yeah. this question around before. I didn't get clear answer on that before. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And and for what it's worth, there there has been some push to try to get the browsers to support that, and they still have, for the most part, said and no. It's it's just computing intensive. Okay. So does one H one per page confirmed? <laughs> Okay. This question I get a lot, actually, from uh, this, and it, it's actually never, never uh, it, they they um, put it out of the specs. So, so this heading structure is a mess. You cannot really read from this what the hierarchy is and what it's actually about. So this should be fixed. So uh, who is going to uh, file the meta ticket? <laughs> okay. So another website. Don't be shy. Oh, yeah, I found a question. Okay. So if you want one that's broken, I can tell you ours. It's www.internetsociety.org, and I know this particular one is broken. Society. Oh, Internet so so society. society. Yeah. Yeah. Dot org. Our headings are a mess. Good. I love a good mess. Oh. Yeah, my English is uh, very much depending on spell checker and it doesn't do it in the <laughs> URL field. <laughs> ah. What is with your keyboard? Oh no, it's just different enough. Is this it? Yeah. Okay. Da -da -da -da. Oh yeah. Nice. Sorry? No, no, go ahead. Okay. Let's blow it up a bit. Oh. Let me do that. Okay. So you have one H4. It starts with an H4, learn more. And then an H1, creating real change. And this is your home page. Yes. So the title of your company is even in the H1. Okay. Then the H2, the latest, and the H3s. These are the latest articles. Yep. Now that's good. And then the H2 again, get involved. And then these are about getting involved. Their actions yeah. Yeah, for its size, probably. Okay. Yeah, I knew this was a because our designer, somebody said exactly that. It's, we chose it because of the size. You know, it's what was lined up in the uh, CSS. You know, yeah. they had this, and it's like, well, this one's the right size, so let's go and do that. So, yes, so this I, is the an semantic example. side of me yeah. just said. Yeah, this is just tell them to use decent CSS to make it semantic in the HTML and look good in. Right, but it in comes size. down to the case that in, in certain places they wanted to, uh, like those right there are the actions underneath the get involved. It's, so what is the future of the internet or other things? These, okay. these, are these call to action buttons? Kind of, Oh, yeah. it's all uh, clickable, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But those, those headings that are there are H4s, which they wanted to be, and they did that because they wanted smaller than the ones that were above that were the titles of the uh, things there. And yes, you could class this in different ways, so that it's an H3 underneath this particular thing. But they chose to do it this way. Okay, so this is wrong. Yeah, it's wrong. <laughs> you wanted a bad example. There you go. Yeah. And this is an H2, creating an internet for everybody. Become a member. Should it be a heading? Should A heading should represent the content that goes below. These are two call to action buttons. You can argue about that. Yeah. <laughs> this is just a lazy develop, uh, this, uh, front end developer. Yeah. For that sort of content, like call to action content, would you just make it a paragraph then? Yeah. Or For yeah, example. Just, yeah. just with a B tag, but you can make it text bigger in CSS. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think a lot of headings can be just uh, paragraphs. Question, can we go to my site, Parsnet? You know me, don't don't make a face. I love you, you know that. <laughs> Rarsnet? Yeah. Rar, rar. Rar yeah, sorry, I'm a... Yeah? Yeah. Net.
so my question is if it's uh, like from content perspective if heading levels like immediately follow each other like for example i have a uh, latest uh, which is what h3 and the post title is uh, h4 right it's correctly nested but it's like immediately there is essentially no content that belongs to h3 so is that okay or there should be some content like ex explaining h3 so to say or this is fine from content structure perspective it is i think if i understand the question well it's fine from content perspective okay so, so what I of if if you have a heading it should be followed by content so here here i have a h3 heading latest followed by h4 which is the title of the post should be do i need content after the latest i, th I think that's fine general that's the, fine in the, in this case in this, it's fine. in this context i think it's fine generally if you use a heading there should be some narrative content before you go to your next heading but I think it's fine in this context. In this context, it's okay. Yeah, thing. I think so too, because it's a logical way. You have the latest, and you can go yeah, to like latest. Yeah, it's like the latest is a and section, then, yeah, and, it and then there's like uh, a H3, yeah. There isn't also one way to actually do stuff. Eh? It's just you have to think for yourself, is this really representing what I want to say? Yeah. Okay, I want to go to... Um, this is my boss, he's filming me. Thank you for that. <laughs> She's the best. She deserves a raise. Yes, especially. Sorry, was I not supposed to do that? <laughs> okay. Awkward. Yes, awkward. Okay, the next one is meaningful link text. And this is actually the same story about as the headings. If I fire, uh, uh, fire up uh, in Safari, as I should, heading structure and we have meaningful in text okay then I start voiceover again voiceover is a very basic screen reader uh, you have better screen readers like NVDA or JAWS they can do much more but uh, voiceover can do a lot and it's easy to uh, learn yourself as a developer so I would um, yeah give you all the chance please try that it's just easy if you have a Mac just control F5 and it fires yeah. Sorry. Do you have an alternative on a Windows platform? Uh, yeah, that's NVDA, and that's a more difficult. Um, oh, Narrator. Here, yeah, you tell. Narrator is built into Windows 10. Uh, it is a good screen reader. It's not as fully featured as the others, but it's getting better. So narrator's built in, you can test with that. NVDA is free, you can download that, not over this connection. And JAWS you would have to pay for, but you can get um, a 40 minute trial uh, for free in order to, to poke it with a stick. For Linux, you would use Orca. Any other platforms? Come on, throw it at me. <laughs> no. Okay. No Amiga. Talkback is native to Android. And Talkback has gotten a lot better in the last couple of releases, so you can rely on that for testing as well. No, no, it's okay. It's just answering this question. Okay. I pulled up the web router again, and I can move around with the arrow keys, and I get a list of links. So if you're blind, you cannot see what's on the page. You think, okay, what links are there? Um, I want to contact someone. So you pull up the list of links and you start typing contact. Now there's no contact page here, but maybe then um, this may be wrong example, but then you can quickly find the link you want, press return, and then you go to that link. So it's super, super fast. But then the link text must actually make sense. And here where it goes wrong often. How many people use click here as link text? download read more really really useful links this is one from a um, from a website where you can order um, uh, order hotel reservations find deals find deals find deals of 
got a question related to this. Um, so I've seen, I've worked with underscores and they use screen, screen, screen reader, reader text, text class yes. to hide yeah. it. Um, but you could use also ARIA label. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? Now Adrian has a fantastic answer about that. Sorry. So the, the risk with ARIA label is it will override the link text. So if your link text says click here and the ARIA label is more verbose, great. If your link text is really good in your ARIA label, just add some additional information, big, big problem. Off-screen text is kind of nice, but there's a thing that a lot of people forget. Only a third of screen reader users, I'm sorry, two-thirds of screen reader users are blind. So you're going to have screen reader users who can see the screen who are going to hear different text or additional text than what is being pronounced. In general, if you can, put all the text in there. If it really, really does break the design, off-screen styles are, are probably a better way to go than relying on ARIA for some of that simpler stuff. So we Does that answer your the question? Screen text. Yeah. <laughs> Did I go too far? Oh, crap, I do that. Oh, no, he's to be challenged. <laughs> we should fight later. So screen reader text first. So screen reader text is the solution. The first, and then ARIA label. Uh, oh, no, first do everything. Then use screen reader text and last um, area label. I'm running it up here, Priyan. We have another question. Okay. This guy. Thank you. Uh, what about when the uh, when the content is uh, all made up by your user, your client, the yeah. content manager? What you have to do is train your content yeah. manager. Yeah. That is uh, really you have to uh, when you. Um, uh, have your site finished and you explain your uh, client how the admin works and stuff. Yeah. This is additional f information. Make good link text, make yeah. good headings, add um, a good alternative text to your yeah. images. That is someone you just need to tell them. Yeah. And you can say it's good for SEO. Yeah. Then it's yeah. always... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you use the Google line. Yes, I do a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So this is really confusing for, for blind people. So what shall I click? And well, this is a no-go. They leave and they won't book with you, so you lose your booking. So how to do this? Read the link text. You can check it with um, um, voiceover. But there's a really nice plugin that's called Funkify. And I have that for... Um, Chrome, and this is really a nice plugin. It checks your headings, it checks your contrast, it checks your link text. Now, in this case, all link text is okay because it's my site. It does a lot more, so this is really a nice one. Um, if you are a designer, um, oh, is it is on. How does someone see your website in the sunshine? how someone with lower vision, like all the text is blurring. This is really nice. Different colors, how you see your site in grayscale. What if you're colorblind? So this is an extra good tool, Funkify. It's for only for Chrome. It was, or for Firefox too? Yeah, this also, for, yeah, this is a nice tool too, Funkify. So that's, the link is with the section about uh, meaningful link text. So, Coolblue. Coolblue is one of the biggest internet sellers in the Netherlands. So, how do they do with the link text? Oh, I don't need to click it. Um, Coolblue. Watch the whole R sortiment. These, these are really weird wing tags. What's this? And what's this? These are images without alternative text. And then they read the whole URL. So that's not user friendly. So, what are these? These are icons without any meaning. These are actually ratings. These are, if you can see this, these ratings. So, 500, what's 500? 500 is actually the amount of reviews they get. 
So these are really hard to understand for people who are blind how to navigate that website. They have actually no idea. So this repeats for every product. You can see where the cursor is there. If you know. So these are really, for such a huge website, it is really uh, costing money because people who are blind, this is bailout. So. So what solution would you offer for this website? I would actually put here, uh, hide the icon, icons with the area hidden and then put alternative text with the screen reader text, like it's from, we have a rating of 4.5 for this product or something. Just uh, do a combination for hiding the, uh, the icons and adding screen reader text for the user to read out. So I think that it's a uh, good combination. May I, th there are a lot of ways to solve this. There really are. That's t totally fine. I've built one of these and I used SVGs and I declared them roll image and I used ARIA labels. Also, you can use SVG as via an image element and use the alt text. So there are a lot of ways to handle it. You just gotta make sure that your alt text and your description makes sense so it doesn't say five, but it says five stars or five hippos or whatever it is. Yep. Sorry, hi. Hi. Um, I would like to ask if um, uh, buttons are read as links for, for screen readers. Because that might be a solution to for that kind of, of thing where you you have make to it click a button. Stuff. Yeah. When then it's does, does the button text is also because the links here, you can also um, call a list of buttons. So um, and right, it's right, very right. useful to know if it's a distinguish between a button and a, and a, a link because yeah, actually, then you know what to expect. Semantically, I think it makes more sense for the rating stuff to be buttons because I you are not linking to something you're actually clicking yeah. just for, for Yeah, that's action. the difference between a button and a link. A yeah. link goes to another destination, a button invokes an action. Yeah, so yeah. The, the screen reader would read it separately, so it, yeah. would, it would be yeah. beneficial, I think. Right. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so this is um, WordPress Europe. How do you think about this? I don't know why I did that. Yeah. What, what is that? Sorry? I can uh, let it read out loud for you. Link, pri link, privacy, oh. policy, link, privacy, policy. I don't know where I am. Wait a minute, just scroll up. Link, link, visited, link, 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 visited, link, at WC Europe on Twitter, link, share, link, https colon slash slash www.adaptalec.com slash country dash specific dash answers slash electrical dash plug dash outlet dash and dash voltage dash information dash for dash Serbia. This is an image without a link, or this image without an alternative text. If you have a link and you put it in an image, you have to have the alternative text as a link uh, where you're going to, to the page you're going to. But we go to uh, that in a minute. Link here. Link, link, this website. This website, what website? <laughs> so read the text. Do the link text make sense? Don't use click here to go to the website or, or you may, uh, Refactor uh, your sentences to make actually the, the where the website is going is underlined as clickable. So read your text. Don't use click here. Voice over off. <laughs> sorry. Oh, the turn to the top. You asked. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, the, the question is with return to top, because it's all capitals, is it going to oh, read you out R-E-T-U-R-N, okay. yeah, 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 or yeah, is yeah. it going to okay, actually say capitals? Yeah, 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 okay. Um, WordCamp Bureau 2018, link, news, visited, link, get tickets, visited, link, 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 sponsors, link, schedule, link, visit, visit, link. So, so that's intro. reading the capitals visited, link, link, as yeah. words. If it's words, I know. Uh, VoiceOver is really smart in that, I think. But if it's a word that's very small, for what act, 
ACT, you have a call yep. to action button called ACT, then it pronounces ACT. Okay. Is yeah. it just this um, one that's, that, that handles capitals better? I had in my head that it would read out each capital. They all handle them differently, and they all use custom heuristics to identify and make best guesses. Capital IT is almost always pronounced IT across them, but uh, regular screen reader Me users too. can override some of that verbosity and, and make some exceptions. Yeah, because here, yeah, um, it's sometimes really smart if you have visited link frequently asked questions. So that knows, yeah. S yeah, S oh, yeah. stock exchange, it also knows the, the, the abbreviation and it reads stock exchange. Meet link, link. So you wanted to know the return to top, okay. Link, return to top, upper row. Upper row, upper row, upper row. Okay. Meeting. Save some time and try a screen reader out. It's really easy to use and it's really fun and it gives you a better understanding how your website is put together. Okay. Last topic and that's a quick one before the break. Um, alternative text for images. How do we do that? Sometimes in WordPress you can add um, an image from the media. And then it alternate then automatic it adds alt is quote quote if you add no um, uh, no text there and that's good then the image is skipped but if the alt attribute is missing from the HTML then it reads the complete URL and that's really annoying so this is really a theme issue if you're a theme builder there is an alt decision tree from the w, um, W3C, and it says, well, is the text presentable? It, it asks all kinds of questions. And then it says, do you have a, need an alt text, or do you need no alt text, or do you need to say something different in the alt text, or do you need to put the image in the CSS instead of in your content? This is a really good one. So that's all. This. You read it in your own time when you, were, uh, uh, you have a rest in your head and you s just try to figure it out. Um, and we also have in the accessibility handbook, we have uh, a chapter about that. So I want you to listen to images. I'm a file of Firefox. Of, um, Alternative text for images in the content test web accessibility web content has keyboard focus. Okay, go on. Alternative text for images in the content test web accessibility web content. Link. Skip to content. Alternative text for images in the content best practice. Give an image a proper alternative text. Alt text. What should the alt text How be? Do I the skip? W3C oh, has a good um, tool for this. The alt decision tree bullet alternative text for image. Alt links menu. Okay. Link. Headings I menu. Head, 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 heading level 3, heading level 3, example, listen to the images. Heading level 3, example, listen to the images. Two very cute kittens in the grass. Photo credit, pixel bay, figure. Two very cute kittens in the grass, image. Photo credit, pixel bay, no alt text. A very long alt text. Oh, this is an image of two very cute kittens in the grass. Maybe some spam for Google to hear, like buyer cat food, dog food, bones to show on and other crap image. Short, to the point alt text. Two cute kittens in the grass. Image. Heading level three. Image. Youth meeting. You get the idea? Don't spam in alternative text because people who are blind already get so many texts put in their ears and don't spam them senseless because you think it's good for Google. Okay. Um, I have a present for you. Um, because you are here and really glad with the turnout, I just changed jobs and my boss Taka um, made swag for us. So you're all getting a set of cards with accessibility design tips. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so. And I thought he had it with him, but he is going. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> These are really nice cards. They're offset printed on pieces of cardstock that you can mail home or stick to your refrigerator. You can also use them to slice very simple cakes. Can I? Uh, I'm running out of things to talk about. 
Um, if you flick them aggressively at your friends, you could get one to stick in their eye. <laughs> Maybe don't do that, um, unless you want to demonstrate to them how much it sucks to not be able to see the screen. I'm just trying to fill dead air here. Um, if you come up with your own ideas, please share them on Twitter by tweeting Rian and make sure you include the name of her employer, which is la, la, what? Level, level, level. Did I get that right? Level, level. So thank Level, level for these awesome postcards no, that are oversized and will require extra postage if you're mailing them to the U.S. No? I don't know. Well, U.S., definitely. We're, we're a bunch of jerks over there. Yeah, yeah, this I know. Oh, okay. okay. Oh, you just got okay. But it's a full set. You might also notice that the typeface uses uh, one of the dyslexia-friendly typefaces, which is helpful to some people who have dyslexia. Uh, you'll also note that because they're heavier on the bottom, as you turn the card over, the letters won't roll off the page. <laughs> I think the camera's still recording. I'm terrified now. Hey, Sammy. Do you want, do you want to start talking? No. Damn it. How's everybody doing? Enjoy lunch? I'm going to... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. We, we can have a, a short break now. Just rest your head. And uh, if you are not a developer and not interested in development, you s can sneak out secretly. But um, <laughs> this will be about development, about code. So uh, Sami is taking over now. Just take a, a few minutes to uh, rest, and then we'll continue. As you probably know, this we kind of touch only like tip of the iceberg here, and this is kind of the meaning of workshops that you get an idea and then you start learning on your own and you have some kind of tools to actually now do how you could test different kind of things. And the last section is about a little bit about perhaps about code. Actually, just like a couple of couple of examples. As I said, we probably need a week to actually go through everything. So it's just a couple of examples here and there. And hopefully you have questions and you can probably install a couple of more tools in your in your laptop. So let's start with the last last sections which is the code part. So you probably all al already have the website open. So we're going to go to the design content and the code part next. So this is kind of the inner talk from the math talks like a couple of years ago. You probably heard it like a million of times already that learn JavaScript deeply, but we honestly believe that you first have to learn the HTML deeply, then probably CSS deeply if you're a front-end developer, and then the JavaScript part. So first build up on your, your roots and then go higher and higher. So that's the kind of the order of things how you should learn. So we have got only like a couple of uh, things that I would like to show in, show in here. And for example, I'm a front-end developer, so if, if you have questions about themes that how to, you know, make them as, as, as good as possible when it comes to accessibility, you can always ask me, and I can link you to a couple of tutorials I have written myself and so on. And there are plenty of information in the handbook, what we, ha what we have been really like the last six months. So the first really easy kind of tool that you can test by yourself in a second is that does your website or pages actually make sense if you don't use the CSS? It's kind of easy way of test uh, without even a screen reader. That does it make sense if you read the pages from top to bottom? Have your CSS some kind of weird rules that you actually uh, switch the content like if it's in the DOM, in the bottom, and actually it's in the top uh, using the CSS, that does it make any sense anymore? So the first easy test for that is, for example, that, okay, take off the CSS of the page. In Firefox, it's really easy to do. There is this view page style, no style, and you can test any page you have that, okay, what does the 
page actually looks like is it still readable when you disable the CSS. And what I want you to do now is actually take your own company side or client side or whatever and disable the CSS and actually does the page still make sense? Can you actually still access all the content and can you read the content? Uh, for example, uh, this 20, I think it's 2015, it had actually one issue. If I disable the CSS in this page, as I said, in Firefox, it's in view, page style, no style. I'm pretty sure you can't read the content anymore. Uh, there is a small tip I can give you why and what's wrong in this theme itself. Um, the issue in this case is that you probably sh uh, shouldn't inject inline styles you've been using JavaScript. Because if the user is disciplined, disciplined the CSS or the CSS doesn't load and you do crazy stuff with styling, inline styling, uh, using JavaScript, this can happen. So this basically means that there is a sticky sidebar in the left and it's inline style uh, coming from the JavaScript. You shouldn't do that. It should be like is sticky glass or something. And after that, it would actually work. If I remember, I can file a bug ticket in the, in the track afterwards. But it's really easy to check that does your website actually works without the, without the CSS. And that's how it's done. You can check it from your own site, for example, now. You can take the Envato site, for example. That actually works and makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> ah, that's, that's a good thing. It means that your HTML structure is really good, which is always the basis of any, any website anyway. So I can just uh, dig it back, and now it kind of make more sense. So the problem in here is that in the sidebar there is kind of a uh, if I just zoom it a little bit as you can see the code a little bit more what's happening behind the scenes is that when the scroll scrolling happens there is this inline style coming from the JavaScript and if there is isn't any CSS loaded it's kind of hard to read the content so try to avoid that so the better way is doing that adding the class is fixed or something like that. And then you can manipulate that with CSS. Any questions about that part? That's kind of the easy, easiest test I can tell you. Then, as, as you can imagine, in many websites you actually have um, dynamic, dynamic content in your site, which means that you can probably filter or search data in your website and uh, it kind of do I need the microphone anymore because I can you know I'm a teacher so I can yes okay thanks yeah no worries so you probably have in many websites dynamic content. The more and more you start building JavaScript-based websites, you probably have dynamic content all over the place anyways. Uh, usually it happens nowadays that you have good be like PHP in the background, but some portions of the site are dynamic, which means that you are filtering data or searching data or something else. Uh, which leads to a question that can, for example, screen reader users actually know that there is dynamic data happening behind the scenes because they might not see the screen. So I have a couple of examples. For example, uh, let's start with a good example. I'm going to fire off the voiceover again. I probably need, don't even need the uh, um, voice. You are currently start, start, start typing. 
period. Typing. Still 147 characters left to type. So why this is a good example is, then, is that the whole point of the text area field is that Space. it gives Space. you how many uh, letters do you have Still left 140 characters to, left to type. write in the text area field. And it actually announces F that D D with a little bit delay, SDSD. right, Still a couple of seconds. Characters left to type. So when I start misspell. typing, SDSD wait a little bit. Still 132 characters left to type. And also the screen readers can actually understand, that, okay, I, I still have like 10 characters left to type in there, which is a good thing. Another example the could be, for example, this you kind of page that I can kind of filter the apartments in this case and there is a similar announcement for the screen readers. If I can see the page, I can kind of understand that, okay, there is something going on in there, but there isn't any announcement behind the scenes. Voice over off. Uh, what does it mean? Sorry, this is kind of getting freaking me out. Yeah, I can actually do that. It's easy. If anyone has questions, I'll make them wear that. <laughs> yep. Yeah, this is easier. So we are actually talking about my Finnish colleague here in a second ago that the WordPress itself actually have, for example, um, NPM packages now available, which means that in this case, what happens behind the scenes is that uh, there is this kind of function that you can use, WP Ali speak function, which is uh, kind of, once again, I think Andrea built it with Joy like a couple of years ago, or even, you know, more time. And that's a really, really simple function that you can use in your JavaScript, which announces live changes, dynamic changes in the page. So if you use JavaScript and dynamic content, that's the function you can use. Or you can just uh, take the similar packages from the LHS model, which, which now are also online. So it's pretty easy. It's like one line of JavaScript and you can announce any dynamic changes. It could be the dynamic change itself could be, it kind of depends on the what kind of change do you have on the site. It could announce that, okay, 100 letters left, or it could announce that, okay, there was search results or there was like 10 search results or something like that. It kind of depends what kind of dynamic content you have. So if you haven't opened VoiceOver or NVDA yet, I would totally encourage you to test VoiceOver or NVDA right now. Open, for example, those examples that exist in here. And you can kind of get the hang with how the VoiceOver or NVDA actually works and how you can, you know, get it up and running. I'm not sure that you have time to do it like in previous section, but I think we have plenty of time now. How many have Max? So you can uh, open the voiceover, uh, the command, command F5. We can help you with that. If you have Windows platform, there might be narrator built in, or you can probably now install the NVDA screen reader also. It doesn't matter if you don't have time to actually test that right now that much, but you can install it already, so you, you are ready to test more like next week or something. So now we, it's time to test some screen readers. We can help you out probably, so we can circle around if you have questions. Do you have any questions about screen reader? You can probably learn more about how to actually use them more later on, but it's good that you actually open it, at least that you know that it exists and how to use it. There was a couple of questions that how to actually uh, keyboard test 
pages because that's like the main main point uh, what you should do anyway in 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 any websites and that's pretty easy and it's it's good that I have the mic now on the other hand and I actually kind of forced to using my bad hand only this is kind of a good example that many many people rely on keyboard only I think we have this is kind of an extra chapter in here Rian have uh, written down kind of a small uh, chapter about how to navigate with keyboard only so the main point is that when you have some kind of changes in the front end it's kind of impossible to automatically test the new changes how how those things work with the keyboard so you have to do it manually it's it kind of means that whatever you can do with your mouse you should be able to do with keyboard only and the main um, things that you can do I think they are listed over here the basics the most basic stuff that you can use with your keyboard is tap or shift tap that means that you go forward uh, using the any interactive element you might have in there it could be a form element or link or button or something if you shift tap you go backwards there might be a form element for example select or something like that you can select then with the arrow keys so you might need arrow keys also arrow down or arrow up you select interactive elements like links or buttons or something like that with enter key or space key and that's about it with those you can test lots of lots of stuff already so what it does it mean it means that you just use only those kind of for example if I start tapping in this page I hit tap I get skip the content link first which is a good thing and after that I can kind of go through any interactive element this is a small small detail but, but because we are now in the code section in here so for example 2017 have kind of in a sense a really common pattern that you would see on mobile view if you have a mobile view this could be your main navigation on mobile also so there are main main items in there but there are sub items behind some kind of button so for example small detail in here is that it's a good thing that when I start okay I'm gonna press shift tab now now I am the parent link element the next tab goes to the which would open the soup menu elements if I tap again where should I go I'm now as you can probably see I am the button that would open the sub menu items but if I tap again where should I actually go yeah I should absolutely go to the next main item because otherwise I wouldn't see anymore where the focus is so the basic one basic rule is that you should always see where are you going and where your focus is so the next tab definitely should go to the next parent element if I open the menu then I naturally go to the sub menu items as you can see this is really common pattern in mobile for example and the same principle that does work on mobile also not just if it's a desktop view should the um, when your focus changes from the child and you move on to the next parent after you've opened a sub menu should the parent close I've just had to implement that on a site and it was a pain in the ass. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, I don't think that's an issue. I would say that it's not a problem at all because, you know, they open it. It's fine to stay open. But then, but then the label still says expanded. Is that, well, I guess that's fine. Yeah. That's fine. If there is another sub, sub menu inside that sub menu, there is just going to be another button for that. And that's fine. Yeah, there are lots of, you know, area altering practices and examples online which you can kind of use as a as a baseline how it should work. And as you mentioned, behind the scenes, we are kind of, you know, popping here and there, but as you mentioned, the area, for example. So if you're familiar with that, in here we, for example, there is... so-called area expand and true or false value. So if I toggle this, you can see that the area expanded value goes to false if it's closed or true if it's open. Now your turn would be kind of test that out with the screen reader, that what does it actually mean for screen reader users, that how that would be announced in the screener. I'm not going to tell you that to answer because it's kind of your job to actually test it out. And uh, it kind of depends on the, on the case that how it would be announced and what kind of screen are you using. But it definitely helps the screen user. Is the menu open or not? So what you can do shortly is that you can go to the navigation, how to navigate with keyboard only. If you haven't actually tested pages without using only the tab and shift tab and enter and space, you definitely should do that like in 30 seconds and you can like test that in that page. You should definitely know how the form elements works, for example, using keyboard only and when you should use arrow keys and when you select something with the enter on space. If you haven't done, done that already, you can do that like in 30 seconds now. For example, if I go here and I tap into that select element with arrow keys, I can actually move up and down in here and with enter I can actually select the one I want. So this is kind of basic, basic stuff, but you, if you haven't tested before, it's good to know how the keyboard, keyboard users use the web and your pages. Same with the radio buttons. You have to use the arrow keys to actually move the focus, the different radio buttons in here. With the checkboxes, you would have to tap to a different checkbox and then hit space for example, space or space again to get it off and then tap again or shift tap, go back and you can activate with the space key and probably with the enter key also. Oh, not actually. So it's only the space key. So that's what you should always pretty much do if if you are testing with the keyboard only. After any front-end changes, you should kind of do it again. Do you have anything else to add to the keyboard testing? This is kind of really short version of it. Because if you keyboard test, you actually discover if the elements you're using get focused or not. If you have a hamburger menu and you put it in a div, a div doesn't get keyboard focus. So if you put it in a button, a button gets keyboard focus. So if you tap, you immediately discover if your code is keyboard accessible and also semantically right. So it's a good quality code a check also. And if you're having the right semantic element for the job. <coughs> there are lots of online tutorials how to kind of create Better themes, for example, I have written a couple of in, in Nevada sites, for example, accessibility tips for WordPress theme developers. There are lot, lots of similar tips like that. 
Excuse me, I have a question. Here. Yeah. Um, what about uh, button and outline for CSS? Uh, I've seen it in many places, people just turn it off. You mean focus outline? Is it, yeah. yeah. Well, you can in some places took the outline CSS rule off, or outline zero, but there should always be some kind of other CSS rules after that that you'd actually implement it somehow. For example, uh, Gutenberg actually have a pretty, I think it's a pretty great solution actually, behind the scenes what happens if you check the CSS, what happens in the Gutenberg and the buttons. I'm pretty sure the outline is taken off in the CSS, outline zero, but then there is border or box shadow, I can't remember at the moment, on the focuses element, but even that is not enough because, for example, if you use the is the correct term the Windows high contrast mode, there are lots of people who use uh, their computers differently than us. It's called, for example, Windows high contrast mode, and that actually takes box shadows, for example, off if I'm correct, and. Uh, What's the trick, for example, in Gutenberg? There is transparent outline. So if there is two pixel uh, and the color is just transparent. So you can't actually kind of see it, but the high contrast mode actually kind of put the borders in there with the transparent color. So there's actually one good example about the Gutenberg that you can check if you want to take the original outline off, if that answers your question. So be careful with the border only or box shadow only solutions because there are like Windows high contrast modes or something similar that takes them off. Did you have any questions about the dynamic content? If you have built pages where you have lots of filtering or stuff happening dynamically, it's kind of really easy to check that do you have that one line of JavaScript code code in your in your code base or not. I'm really sorry to disappoint Ulrich and other automated geniuses in the room. Uh, there are no such thing that you can automate test every accessibility issues in the world. Um, there is absolutely brilliant, uh, brilliant um, article about uh, government of UK, which have kind of created the world's least accessibility web page, and they kind of tested all these tools that we have used today. For example, the Arc, Ax or Wave or similar tools. There is no such tool that I can actually, you know, fix everything for you or even pick everything that kind of issues you might have in there. It could be like 30 to 50 percent of issues they might pick up. So it's kind of always your responsibility to actually uh, test your sites and web pages manually also. And if you have the budget, probably with, with other users also with different kind of disabilities. But there are a couple of tools that I would definitely kind of um, encourage you to install in your own, own laptop and kind of encourage your team also to do that. They are listed, listed here in below. So in the page automated testing, there, there are a couple of tools uh, for the React. I don't go to React myself, for example, that I don't know the exact details how good these are, but for example, uh, Gutenberg uses, for example, this uh, plugin called JSX Alley, which gives you some kind of hints even somewhere, but it's definitely not, you know, enough what happens in the front end, in the end, or React have the same. 
for example, in, in yesterday's contributors day, there are a couple of tables uh, fixing the coding standard errors. These, these are not even uh, directly to the involved with the accessibility, but I would still encourage you to kind of create in, inside your company some kind of coding standards that you follow. It could be directly to, directly to the WordPress coding standards or modified with those or something. But you should definitely use PHP CS sniffer in your tool set, uh, which sniffs the PHP part. Then you should use ESLint for JavaScript and uh, StyleLint or similar to CSS. Naturally, those are not kind of directly into the accessibility stuff, but those are kind of the tools that you should anyways have in your tool set. I think we probably don't have time today to actually go more into details. I'm just going to leave the links in there. If you don't know what they are, there are like plenty of in more information in those websites, what they actually mean. But what I would like you to install next in your own laptop, we already talked about a couple of tools that you can install as an extension in your Chrome or Firefox. But probably most of you are developers in here at the moment, so you probably like the CLA stuff and using everything on command line. So you can use the same tools on command line also. So it's kind of important to realize that it's impossible to check your code base. Uh, it doesn't matter if you build size with PHP or JavaScript or whatever, because it doesn't, it's not the ready HTML in the front end at that point. So you always have to test against to an actual front end stuff what happens in the DOM. And that's kind of a big barrier in the automated testing also, because you always have to test the DOM itself. And there are a couple of tools that you can install in a second. For example, Pali or XCLI, which are both pretty nice command line tools, which you can use. We already talked about the Axe extension beforehand, which, which was the extension that you can use. Oops. Extension you can use in Chrome or Firefox. In Chrome, you, for example, had, had an extra tab called Axe, and you can analyze any page. Uh, these are the same kind of tools, but used in the command line. And you, as you can probably imagine, if it happens in the command line, you can probably sort of automate stuff more easily when you don't have to kind of go to the browser itself. Both kind of works in the same way. There's a command line like Pali or X, and then you just give an URL or a list of URLs that you want to check. So you can test live sites or locally installed sites if you have a setup already in your laptop. And it's basically gives you the same kind of stuff that the extension would give you. So what I want you to do next is that you would actually install the Pali and X in your laptop and actually run a couple of tests with your own, own site or client site. Uh, you would need to have to NPM on your laptop before you can actually install those. So after that, it's just, okay, polyfoxland.fi, for example. It's probably going to give me a couple of, yep, couple of errors in there. You are loud enough to scream almost. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so my question is, uh, what is the difference between those two? Because I I was able to uh, install Axe, 
but the the first one uh, needs uh, node version eight, and oh, I have okay. six, yeah, and yeah, I don't yeah. want to break other things mm -hmm. I have. Yeah. So is there uh, uh, something Which that is better to do with uh, the first one? I don't know. That's. Uh, in my opinion, that's just a little bit different in a sense. That's why I kind of use both in there, in a sense. The Axel, I kind of, uh, it run the same test that the extension would kind of uh -huh. give you. Okay. And okay. the Pali, it's kind of checking the HTML code sniffer. Okay. So we probably know the more. Or if you are mentioning that what happens Actually, uh, Pierre is going to use the X engine soon, so uh -huh. they will be the same. Okay, thank you, thank you. Yeah, Bali is probably going to use the X like really soon. I don't think it's published yet at the moment, but probably soon they are both like <laughs> together, so you don't have to use both. Any other questions? Did you get it installed? If you have the NPM, you might have that kind of node version problems. Uh, no, just this is not a question, just a, a note. I'm doing Pali at the moment, but it's installing Chromium, which is like 125 megabytes. I'm not sure if that's going to be a problem for our bandwidth. I thought I'd just. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be a big, big, big yeah, package. Yeah, anyway, that's true. That's kind of a. <laughs> Hard things with everything's covered packages that so huge. Yeah, not necessarily a question, but Lighthouse uses Axe to do its things, and uh, Lighthouse is part of Google already, so you can just do the audits from your browser. You can actually do lots of stuff in the browser inspector in Chrome and Firefox already. We just haven't have a kind of time to call them all through. For example, as you said, Lighthouse is already using Axe behind the scenes, so <laughs> they're kind of all using the Axe in a sense, at least soon, because Bali is also using it soon. Any other questions about these tools? You could probably even go that far that before you can commit something to back to the Git, you can run those tests beforehand, actually, that you can you know, fix them beforehand, before the deploy into the live site. We could have, have like tons of tons of, you know, different kind of patterns that we usually see in the internet, but the one example is, which is pretty common one, is the models, some kind of dialog models that opens in the, the page. And there are a couple of really good ones. For example, Ali Dialog is one of the best ones I've seen. And if you need to have a, some kind of model in your website, I would definitely use that one. It put, and at first, it's vanilla JS, and it's pretty lightweight in that sense. And that's another test you can, you can use using your screen reader, that how the model actually should work behind the scenes. And you can test it also with the keyboard. So when I start using the models with keyboard, there are several, several things that should actually work. For example, when I open that model, the focus should switch into the model. In this case, it's the close button. That's OK. It could be something else also. And the focus should actually stay inside the model. Because models are usually designed in a way that it's kind of in front of the main content. And you can't actually see the main content any, anymore. So the focus stays in, in the content. And you should be able to close the model with the ESC key also. So when I press ESC, it goes back to the same place where I started. So it's really important that the focus actually goes back to the same place. So now, if you already installed or you have the Mac, you can quickly test that model, how it actually pronounce 
to stop what happens when you open, for example, models. And once again, all those are outlined already in the area best practices. You don't have to reinvent the wheel, what should happen. Just read the guidelines and that's it. If you don't want the code themselves, there are plenty of good examples, but many more bad examples out there. For example, models, this is really good one, what I should recommend to use. So if you want to test it out with the screen reader, just fire up your voiceover or narrator or NVDA and just check that what should actually the screen reader announce when you open the model. I can do it here with the silence. So it basically, there are a couple of more area stuff going on behind the scenes. So it actually pronounces you something, okay, what kind of stuff just happened there? And then you can tap around the model itself and there are like similar stuff that would be in the main content also. In this case, there happens to be a form and an assign a pattern and a close pattern. But when you first open the actual model, that's the critical point that what, what the voiceover or any screen reader actually announce at that point. Any screen reader user kind of needs to know that, okay, some model just opened and inform what kind of content there might be. In this case, it's gonna pronounce the title and the next paragraph, what's gonna be in the actual model. And behind the scenes, there are lots of, uh, lots of, uh, not that many actually, but a couple of details which you can check, check that, okay, there is area labeled by or area described by, which are announced by the screen reader. So if, if we would have time, we would like another five hours talked about the area stuff what could help help you to give the more information for the screen reader users. Do you have any questions? Those are like really only a couple of basic, basic, basic examples what you can do to test your code. Yep. And we didn't even start kind of the theming part <laughs> because that would be another day or a couple of days. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I was wondering if, if you know already that if there's a if there's a, a CLI tool for something like the X, X CLI pre commit hook, so that it parses the results and then you could uh, deny the committing. I've set up Stylelint and or SASLint and ESLint and PHPCS, and they're kind of easy because you can find. NPM packages to them, but I haven't yet found any for a Kind of same here. I haven't actually found a good solution for that, but I kind of ima imagine that it should be kind of possible. Maybe the issue is there is the same that kind of uh, how do I kind of inject the URLs in there that what should I actually test? Should I test uh, some kind of deployment side or live side or your you know, your site, what you're actually building in the laptop, like your local site. So it kind of depends on that. You could kind of, for example, what I kind of have been thinking that I would chuck, like manually put some local addresses in there because you probably have some kind of similar local environment in every developer. So you kind of already know the, what the local 
URL is going to be. So you can kind of test the most common pages in one go because you probably know, okay, this is the front page. This is some other landing page, which is really important. This is another important page. So you could, you could probably manually test all those local URLs. That's what I would probably do, but I haven't done it already. But If you add it to a pre-commit hook, hook um, X uh, um, only um, returns one or zero, and um, this and it gives false positives, also misses things, and uh, does not make a distinguish between um, an error and a warning. So maybe it's a warning, and you say, okay, that's okay for me, but it still rejects your code as being, uh, and then your commit breaks. So it's. Uh, you have to be careful to actually depend on what X says to, uh, to your pre-commit hook. Can, can I toss something in here as well? Yeah, definitely. If, if I understood the question correctly, part of it is you want to limit commits based on errors you find. Yeah. Is that correct? Um, I would suggest also taking a look at Tenon, which is a paid platform, uh, T-E-N-O-N dot I-O. Yeah. Tenon allows you to customize rule sets, and it will integrate with your cucumber, gherkin, pickle, zucchini, workflow, whatever it is. Um, the idea there is you can say, not only are these the WCAG rules you have to honor before we'll allow a commit, but we can create custom rules that can override or that have your own uh, accessibility standards that go a step beyond that. And it'll integrate directly into your workflow. So con consider that if you're willing to spend some coin. Yeah, Tenon, Tenon is a one good example that you should look out. We, d we didn't have actually that in our list, but that's definitely one of the good tools out there. It's built by the man called Carl Gross, I think. So that's a one, one good tool in your tool set. I think you can probably do similar thing in Axe also, so you can kind of hack your own rules in there, but I haven't done it personally. Any other questions? We are not tired yet, you know. <laughs> we don't need food or go to the bathroom or anything. Yeah, I think we can wrap it up. You know, upload yourself because you come in here, you are kind of interested in the accessibility. Now it's kind of your turn to actually learn some more and test some more and then ed educate your you know, colleagues in your, in your own company. And you can always ask me, Rian, or anybody else in Slack or Twitter more questions. Yeah, and like I said many, many times, we really are trying to have good information in the, the accessibility handbook itself. We know that it's only short examples, but in every short examples, there are bunch of bunch of more resources for example, written by Andrea or Adrian. So there are lots of lots of information available and we kind of created that beforehand for you. So it would be really nice that you would actually use that. So. What I want to give, a, give to you is look at your website differently. If you look through the, through the design, really at the code, then this is worthwhile because this is what we want to achieve. Look at really beyond what you usually see as a developer. Thank you. Yep, thanks you.